So, Pete, take it. Well, thank you for the uh, introduction. I appreciate it. And thank you all for being here. Um, you being here means a lot to me, and I love seeing all your faces. <clears throat> so today I'm going to share with Today I'm going to share with you my uh, master's project. And the main purpose of this project was to build on and make systematic some of the modern techniques we use for describing location, um, particularly with biodiversity specimens, but this could be extrapolated to other cases as well. And to do that first, I'm going to uh, talk to you a bit about context and how we describe location, um, the importance of describing location, and the way that we describe location, how that affects the resulting data that we get out of a specimen. And then after that, I want to talk a bit about the specific methods that I came up with um, that are um, aimed to, I don't know, improve on some of the existing methods that I wasn't totally satisfied with when I was doing georeferencing. And at the end, uh, I want to discuss a bit about who I think these methods can benefit and uh, some future directions I'd like to see these concepts taken in. So first of all, context. Uh, context matters. So the main purpose of a biodiversity collection like the one here at KU is to document the who, what, when, where, and why of a specimen. So, um, you know, you collect a specimen in the fields, you record where you found it, what day you found it, who found it, why you found it, what it was, those sorts of things. And if you remove any one of those pieces of information, um, it has a cascading effect on the quality of the specimen and its, its, um, its usefulness in science. So when you remove the where of a specimen, right, you lose out on lots of environmental information and really the ecology history of a specimen and sometimes the evolutionary history as well. Things like environmental pressures, um, resources it might have taken advantage of, population contexts, um, the specific type of niche an animal might have existed within, all these kind of things are important. And so <clears throat> how do we describe context? What does, it, what does it mean to have a specimen in a geographic spot? Well, the first way we can describe it is through text, right? So a textual description of locality. So here you can see the specimen was described as collected in Guyana in the Berbice district on the west bank of the Berbice River uh, near Dubalay Ranch. So what does that mean? Well, one problem with textual descriptions is that they're highly relative, right? And they come in many different flavors. So any one of these ways, any one of these four ways that the specimen was described is perfectly valid. All of these particular types of locality descriptions pop up constantly in collections, um, but they're all subjective. So what does it mean to be on the west bank of the Berbice River? Well, the Berbice River is 350 miles long and 50 miles of it are in the Berbice district. So when you say on the west bank of the 50 mile stretch, what are you talking about, right? Um, and that's not to necessarily put down textual locality descriptions because before the 90s, that's really the most convenient um, quality that was available. Uh, before satellites were introduced um, for public use after um, they were kind of declouded for military purposes, uh, this was really the most convenient way that we could we could describe locality. So um, what's the alternative? Well, besides text, we have numerical descriptions. We have coordinates. So instead of describing the specimen using words, we can describe it using numbers um, that come in the form of a latitude and a longitude which assigned to uh, a sort of grid that covers the globe. And um, hopefully those also come with uncertainty as well. And coordinates are nice because no matter where the river bends or where a city moves to, or if a ranch still exists in the future, the coordinates will always point to the same point on the globe. They will, they're standardized, they're objective. As long as we know who made the coordinates and why, or using what system they made the coordinates, we will always be able to pinpoint the exact location that that is on the globe, which means that all that environmental information is carried over from generation to generation as well. And the nice thing about coordinates is that they're, they are uh, ready to, for computational analysis. So a computer doesn't know how to handle the text that we write down. It needs to be converted into the numbers somehow. So if we wanna do a nearest neighbor analysis or niche modeling or any of these other kind of computational efforts, uh, the specimens need to be in numerical form. So how do we get from text form to numerical form? Well, that process is called georeferencing. So to georeference something is to take a text description or a photo and you assign it those coordinate points on the grid. So in this case, I want you to imagine a specimen was found and described as KU main campus. So here we have an aerial photo of the KU main campus. 
And the first issue that we run into is that there's an infinite number of points within the KU main campus. So depending on how many uh, decimal places you wanna go on your numerical description, it could be literally anywhere within this orange shape. So the compromise that we use is called the point radius method. And the first thing we do is we take the geographic average of the defined space. So in that case, that is the, the orange polygon that traces the outline of the KU main campus. So we can get our points from the, the geographic mean or the centroid. And then we draw a line to the farthest point of that space from the centroid, and that is our uncertainty in meters. And it's called the point radius method because this defines a circle that encapsulates the area that we then say the specimen could have been anywhere within. So using these three numbers, we can give an area of certainty that that says that anywhere within this circle, the specimen um, could have been validly found within. So to walk through basically how locality description affects the way um, or affects the quality of the numbers that result from it, I want to go through a bit of a case study. So we have a baseball that was hit by Ichiro Suzuki, who plays for the Seattle Mariners. Seattle Mariners are based in the state of Washington. And we have a text description for the baseball. And I want to show you what happens um, when the text description changes. So first we have at the state province level. So if we say the baseball was found in the state of Washington, here's what we here's the numerical results we get when we georeference it. So the uncertainty is 341 kilometers. And the coordinates are in the dead center of the state in a desert. And what I want to point out is the number of different environments you get when you, um, you categorize something at this level. So we have, we have deserts, we have snowy mountain caps, we have uh, tropical forests, we have boreal forests, we have estuaries, we have wetlands, we have all these different types of environments um, that the specimen could have all validly been found within. So it doesn't really tell you much um, about the certainty of the, the environment that the specimen was, was living within. So then we had the city level and it gets a bit better. Now we're at 19 kilometers, but there's still quite a few environments here. We, again, we have lots of water, lots of forests. Um, of course, there's urban landscapes which have different environments as well, but still not very narrow, still not very useful for computational analysis um, when your environments are described at uh, the four kilometer level. And then we have locale. So this is the stadium that the baseball was hit within. So now the uncertainty is down to basically 300 meters. And the number of environments that could have existed within are reduced to two, maybe three different environments, right? And I wanna point out that between the coarsest description and the finest description, the coordinates for the specimen have moved 150 kilometers west. We've reduced the number of possible environments that could have existed within by several, several factors. And the uncertainty is much, much more precise. And so, um, hi, hello. And so the way that the text describes the location of a specimen has a huge, huge impact on the, the numerical results uh, from georeferencing and the amount of usefulness we can pull from it uh, when doing statistical analysis. So uh, that's the effect of locality descriptions. Now I wanna talk about the types of descriptions that exist and how they affect different levels of uh, accuracy. So the first type of locality is the ones that I mentioned before, which are basically just a specific locality. So a city, a national park, a township, an address, a specific place. So this specimen was found in Winfield, Kansas. Well, great, we can just georeference the city of Winfield. But there's a whole class of locality descriptions that are relative to locality, right? So we have, in this case, uh, the specimen was found nine miles north of Elkhart, Kansas. Well, we can't just georeference Elkhart. We have to georeference Elkhart, and then we have to find the space and the uncertainty involved with moving from that position. Because if you imagine uh, a cone that expen extends nine miles north of Elkhart, um, we get a lot of uncertainty from that displacement from the, the locality that's being referenced. And so each of these relative types of locality description need specific methods to georeference. They have lots of rules and they 
uh, each have their own uncertainty penalty that they kind of kind of have by the nature of their existence. So who makes those rules? Well, first I want to talk about Darwin Core. So Darwin Core is a um, sort of digital data format that is used by lots of biodiversity uh, data aggregators. And the specific ones aren't necessarily important, but it's a lot of them. It's most of them, and it's all the big names too. And uh, the people that came up with this data format, um, the idea was that anybody in the world can access this data and know what they're getting because it's all in a uniform format and they can plug it into their analyses and it works right away because it's all standardized. Well, the same people that made Darwin Core made the georeferencing quick reference guide. And this reference guide uh, was made over basically two decades. I think the first version was in 2004. And it's very detailed and it's very easy to follow. And it's an incredible resource for people trying to georeference. But there are a few specific methods in it that uh, I didn't find totally satisfactory. So I've kind of gone over the importance of context, why context matters, how we describe context, um, the effects of describing context in specific ways, and how we get from uh, textual descriptions to numeric descriptions. So now I want to go over some of those specific methods that, that uh, I took umbrance with in the georeferencing quick reference guide. So there's five specific methods I'm going to point out here. The first two near a feature and only a heading from a feature. Um, the current methods are kind of arbitrary. The next two features, paths, roads, and rivers, and intersections, these are kind of linear features. Um, their interpretations in the quick reference guide are kind of narrow. They don't, they're not open to a lot of different interpretations of the text. And then the final method uh, on the border of was not defined in the georeferencing guide. That's one that's kind of bespoke. And so these all have the same issue, which is how do you define near? What does it mean to be near something? Um, so here I have the city of Lawrence. You can see it's outlined in gray here. And all this green space is area that is not technically part of the uh, city limits. And so here's where the city limits stop. So this is one interpretation of near, that is within a few meters of the city of Lawrence. Here's where the city mailing addresses stop. And there's a 13 kilometer difference between these positions. So that's, that's several different types of environments that can exist between the city and the loosest interpretation of what it means to be near Lawrence. So how do we define this amorphous concept? Well, my interpretation is through Voronoi polygons. So, a Voronoi polygon will describe the area closer to a point than to any other point in a collection of points. So in this example, in this example, we have five points, A, B, C, D, and F, and each one of them has a polygon surrounding it. And if you exist anywhere within one of those polygons, you're closer to the point it surrounds than any of the other points. So if you imagine these five points are all fire stations and a fire breaks out in the green polygon, then fire station C should be the first to respond because they're closer to the fire than any of the other stations. And this concept and this technique is used readily in quantitative geography already um, with things like water basins. So figuring out where water flows to or where it's coming from. Cell tower coverage. So if you're within the Voronoi polygon of a specific cell tower, you should be connecting to that one than any other cell tower near you. And urban planning. So here again, we have the city of Lawrence and each of these red triangles is an elementary school in Lawrence. And these orange polygons are the, the boundaries for the schools. So if your house is, exists anywhere within this polygon on the left, then you should go to this elementary school. And we, if we overlay the Voronoi polygons of the elementary schools, we can see they fit pretty well with the city boundaries. So when you take out municipal issues like roads and resources and those sorts of things, on the outskirts of town, you can see the Voronoi polygons fit really well. So like out here, all of this area is closer to this school, so it should go to this school. On the north end of town, past the river, same concept, right? So this is um, a readily used technique already. There's lots of algorithms for it, and they're pretty simple to make. So how can we apply them to these specific methods? So the first example is near a feature. So we're saying that the locality isn't a specific place, but the area near a place. And the quick reference guide 
right now, their method is to just arbitrarily expand the locality that's being referenced, and then you georeference that resulting shape. So here on the bottom in figure A, you can see the city of Salina. So if we had a specimen that was described as near Salina, I just arbitrarily expanded the border of Salina by a kilometer, and then I would georeference the orange shapes surrounding the city of Salina, and that would be that would be our georeference. <laughs> Um, but I wanted something more systematic and more scientific and reproducible. And uh, I found that if you use Voronoi polygons, you can literally define the space that is nearer to Salina than any of the other surrounding cities. So uh, this polygon that surrounds Salina here is the Voronoi polygon for it. And this would be the, the shape that you then georeference. So uh, it's this space that surrounds Salina is quite literally nearer to Salina than any of the other cities. So it's just a more objective and systematic way of defining um, what it means to be near a particular location. And in that same vein, we have heading from a feature. So again, Salina as our reference point collected north of Salina. So this, the current best practice is to basically uh, you start a cone at the locality that's being described. So in this case, Salina, and you just extend the cone arbitrarily until it hits some kind of border. It, the quick reference guide doesn't really define what kind of border that needs to be or how you should decide when to stop it. It just says, pick a border. So using Voronoi polygons, we can literally define that border. We can literally define the space that belongs to Salina or is near Salina. And then we can take our cone and slice out that section. So here in the purple shaded region, you can see this is the area that is north of Salina. It's not southeast of Culver and it's not northwest of New Cambria, it's north of Salina. And um, then you would georeference this purple shaded region. And then we have a little bit more of a systematic way of defining the direction from the locality being described. So the next methods, are for intersections. And the current best practice for intersections is to literally define the space that makes up the intersection. So if you have a 10 meter wide road and a 10 meter wide road and they're intersecting, then you have a 10 square meter slice that is your locality. And you can see in this top image, that's basically what I've done. Uh, each of these orange circles are a georeferenced uh, intersection. So they're very, very tight. They assume a lot about what the author is trying to express, which is that the specimen was literally found at the crossroads of the two, the two roads. Well, using Voronoi polygons, we can describe the space around each intersection. So this method is more open to the interpretation that um, the author is using an intersection as a reference point and not necessarily the literal location that they collected in. So Whereas the intersections are literally just pavement, uh, the Voronoi methods include all the surrounding vegetation, all the different flora and fauna around intersections that could also include the specimen that was being collected. And then along those lines, we also have linear features. So things like paths and rivers. This is the Little Wakarusa Creek. And the current method for defining the space uh, belonging to Little Wak Wakarusa Creek is to take the geographic average. So again, just the point radius method, and then you draw your distance to the terminal end of that path. Well, my issue with this method is that at the terminal ends, there's no room for error. If you were to have collected the specimen at the Southern end of the river, you cannot have collected it any more Southern than the tip of the river or the, the point radius method will not include the space that you actually sampled the specimen from. So the alternative is to use Voronoi polygons. And here you can see the red shape that outlines the Little Wakarusa Creek. And in this interpretation, um, only the space that is nearer to the Little Wakarusa Creek compared to all the other surrounding creeks is considered the space of the river or the creek. And then that would be our georeference point. And now we have a lot more space near the creek as opposed to literally the creek. So this is a little more open to different interpretations of text. Um, especially for things like terrestrial specimens, so birds, mammals, things that you almost certainly wouldn't find in the creek, uh, but around it. It's much more understanding of those uh, different interpretations. And finally, we have on the border of. So this is a specimen with a lot of different descriptions, but the one I want to focus on is near Barnes and Ransom County borders. And this is a common um, locality description and uh, 
when you're at the intersection of two municipal boundaries, very rarely is there a line drawn in the sand that tells you exactly where one county stops and where one county starts, unless you're along a road or something. But even then, it's not exact. So here, I've taken the, uh, the linear feature that is the literal intersection of the Barnes and Ransom County border, and I've georeferenced that. And using the blue shape, we can literally define the space that is closer to the border of the two counties as opposed to the other boundaries of the counties themselves. So this way we give some shape to another amorphous concept that um, didn't really have a method for describing it in the first place. And so those are my specific methods. Um, those are my attempts to improve on the uh, georeferencing quick reference guide. And now I wanna talk about who these methods are for, who can utilize them, and some places that I think I wanna improve on these methods in the future. So first of all, we have a lot of georeferencing to do. Um, so I use GBIF as a subsample of specimens here because it's one of the biggest, biggest data aggregators right now. Um, and they have about 225 million records of preserved specimens. So that is specimens that are either from a museum or have some kind of voucher associated with them to prove that they exist. And of the 225 million preserved specimens, 94 and a half million of them don't have coordinates. That's not 94 and a half million that have good coordinates, but just don't have them at all. And that's about 42% of all the specimens. Worse than that is uncertainty. So 100, basically 177 million of those specimens have no uncertainty associated with them at all. Um, and so that's 177 million specimens that even if they all had coordinates, we would just have to assume that they were georeferenced properly and that the person was being as literal as possible about the location of that specimen. And it's not like these can't be georeferenced. Basically every one of these uh, specimens has some kind of locality description. Uh, it's just the work needs to be done. And for these specific methods that I've outlined, um, I subsampled iDigBio because it's much easier to uh, search through, um, but it's another data aggregator like GBIF. And they have 137.6 million specimens and about 8.4 million of those include the word near in some form of their description or the word river. Now I outlined a lot of other methods, but they're a little harder to match with, but these are the explicit ones that I can narrow down. That's about 10 to 15% of all those specimens, which doesn't sound like a lot until you realize that's like 15 million specimens that are just sitting there and can't be used for modern data analysis. And uh, I wanna target some of the specific collections that I think could benefit from these methods. So like Town mentioned briefly, um, I came up with these methods while georeferencing a, a historical tick collection. And these ticks were mailed into the professor at K-State, his name was Mock, Professor Mock. They were mailed into him from all across Kansas by just citizen scientists. They're just people that wanted to have these ticks tested for diseases. And so they had no sense of best practices or scientific rigor or any of these sort of things. And so what you see here on this map is all the points that were not written by citizen scientists that I was able to georeference. And here using my methods, you can see all the extra points that are added to the map um, that are citizen scientists based. So um, not just citizen scientists based, but benefited from the methods that I came up with. And that's about 660 records accounting for about 2,700 specimens. So these are all records that are perfectly valid for science, still have specimens stored at K-State that just would not have had any geographic life without these methods. And um, I also wanna point out just historical collections in general. So just by the nature of them, they existed before geographic coordinates were readily available. Now we've always had like quadrangle maps since the early 1800s or the late 1800s, but they're very coarse. Um, I think a quadrangle is about 15 kilometers by 15 kilometers, something like that. So even if you had the means to georeference using coordinates, it was not very practical. Um, and basically, as far as I can tell, every museum has their own standards or had their own standards. Now in the digital era, things are a little more uniform, 
But before the digital era, basically every museum had their form of collecting and preparing study specimens best practices. And they were not always uniform. In fact, they usually weren't uniform. And a lot of places didn't even have these sorts of uh, standards at all, like private collections or things like that. So these are some areas where I think um, input data isn't necessarily the finest or there's still work to be done and that I think would especially benefit from my particular methods. And then on larger scale, uh, I think it would be pretty easy to make a Veronoi polygon database of some sort. So you can imagine a huge, uh, highly detailed uh, geographic map of the US with all the cities on it. We already have all this data from USGS and from Census Bureau and those sort of organizations. So we already have all the geographic shapes of cities. Someone just needs to go in and do the computational effort to make all the Veronoi diagrams. And then it doesn't have to be done again in theory until the cities change shape or move. And that brings me to the point of temporal databases. So cities don't change very quickly necessarily, but they do change on a human time scale. So what you can see up here is a map of Lawrence from 1889. This little black shape is the city limits of Lawrence. And hopefully you can see that all right in the back, but I've overlaid a modern map of Lawrence on top of it. So here, the gray outline of Lawrence, you can see the shape has basically tripled in size. There's now a lake here that wasn't there before. The rivers changed courses. This city of Franklin is now gone and has been absorbed into Lawrence. Um, you know, creeks have changed paths, rivers have changed paths. All these sorts of things don't change very quickly, but they do change in a relevant way to us. And historical collections have plenty of specimens that are from time periods before um, modern day shapes. So um, not only a database of relevant modern Veronoi polygons, but historical polygons would be convenient too. And all these sorts of um, efforts can be uploaded to collaborative georeferencing efforts. So um, tools like geolocate are uh, crowd crowdsourced. So if I have a collection full of locality descriptions and text format, and I've gone through the effort of georeferencing every one of them and giving them numerical descriptions, I can upload them to geolocate. And then if you take your specimen and you type in its textual description, if they match, then you don't have to do all the georeferencing because I've already done it for you and the numbers are just spit out to you. So this kind of idea of like making a Veronoi polygon database and then having it readily accessible is very real. And I think is a, it's a good place to move forward with these methods. And then for future developments, uh, first is the weighted Veronoi diagrams. So this yellow figure up here is the city of Wichita and it has double the population of the next biggest city in Kansas. And each of the surrounding cities are, the, uh, are in green here. And what happens when you take the Veronoi polygon of Wichita is that all these smaller cities kind of hem in the shape because they're quite near to the city. So the space isn't defined very well. Well, an alternative to that is to weight the city somehow. So give them some kind of numerical representation that orders them Maybe it's population, maybe it's uh, land coverage, something like that. And what happens down here is you can see in a weighted Veronoi diagram, the bigger shapes sort of encapsulate the smaller ones. And so the area is more evenly organized. And this is often an issue with um, places that people might reference more readily than the smaller places. So for instance, uh, if you know about Elton, Illinois, you probably know about Chicago, but if you know about Chicago, you may or may not know about Elton. So this kind of concept of like things with bigger prominence, um, they don't always take up more space, but sometimes they can, and sometimes those smaller shapes can kind of hem them in. So a way to Veronoi's would be one way to tackle that problem. And then we also have well-known text format. So Currently, like I described before, point radius method is kind of the gold standard, it's the go-to, but it's a simplification of the shapes. So if you remember back to the, the KU main campus example, that shape was kind of complex and the point radius method is a way to simplify that shape down into just three numbers. Well, well-known text is kind of an underutilized um, field in the, um, in the Darwin core standards right now, but it does exist and it is used. And it's just a way to literally define the space of a shape. So instead of having just three numbers that describe a polygon, you would have 
one number for each one of the vertexes of the polygon. And that way we can literally define the space instead of just estimating the space. And one thing that I think the Voronoi polygons are good at is defining amorphous shapes that don't really have a shape otherwise. So I think a well-known text format, when explored more by science, will be um, benefited greatly by the Voronoi methods. And that's that's kind of my presentation. That's what I have for you. So I want to thank um, my girlfriend Morgan for her ceaseless kindness and and help through this adventure. Uh, my friends and family. Any of you in this room, I probably bothered you with a question at some point, and I appreciate you giving me the time to answer me. Um, yeah, that's what I have for you. I'll take any questions now. <laughs>